Welcome back. I am Jeremy Salinas, a.k.a. Drakenstrike, and this is Man vs. Meeple, the show where we talk about everything board game related. This review is not about the 2010 Merchants and Marauders, which was a pickup and deliver game. It is about the 2016 hand management game, which revolves around two ships throwing massive salvos at each other. And to help me talk to you all about it is David Waybright. Hello once again, everyone. Thanks for watching. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about this. I've never actually played the old Merchants and Marauders. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one. If you watched our Gen Con preview, this was on my top 10 list for sure. And I still think it's there. I, uh, I really enjoyed it, although I've taken a beating mm. pl being, uh, playing it with Jeremy. But it's a really good thematic game and uh, quite a bit different, like Jeremy said, than the uh, other Merchants and Marauders. So, yeah, it is a two-player game. Uh, two which is right there, a complete difference from the regular right. Merchants and Marauders. And it plays in about 45 minutes, which is, which is right about the time that we finished our second yep. game of it. Yep. Um, so, as we said, the whole game revolves around taking two ships, two massive galleons, and just firing salvos at each other until one of them goes down right. in flames. It's, it's, if, if your dream is a pirate battle... This is it. And it's, did you say a long time ago when we were doing a previous review that you've played a game like this years and years and years ago? When I was a kid, there was a game called Broadsides and Boarding Parties or something like that. It was a Milton Bradley game. Uh -huh. had these two big ships and it had a big map, but then when the ships came in towards each other, yeah. uh, you had a broadside. So there was a big battle, shooting cannons, people boarding ships. There's no there's no boarding of ships in this game. It's all about just firing cannons. Uh -huh. But that's, that's kind of one of those nostalgic memories that made me want to try this game out. This is one of the first things I purchased at Gen Con, uh, and we've had a few chances to play it now, and it's grown on me. Uh -huh. You know, I think we got a few things a little wrong the first Definitely time. Definitely wrong, which affected our experience with the game entirely, because yeah. it played much, much differently the second time we played through it. Um, and there's, there's some things that I really like about it. There's some things that I'm not so sure yet about it, so mm -hmm. we'll get to that uh, sure. eventually. So, uh, this is the setup of the game that you see here. Uh, there's two player boards, and each player board represents one of the two ships. And they are double-sided, so I'm playing a pirate ship, like a ghost ship. Yeah. <laughs> and you're playing more of a, uh, you know, like a, a French fleet going yeah, out there yeah. and, and doing whatever. The setup on each of them is identical. You're going to have some sails up in the top, a, a deck full of your crew people. You have a first mate and a captain. Um, and then on the bottom are your planks for the, the side of your ship. Yeah, basically these are all the pieces that can get slowly or quickly picked apart and taken off of your ship. Yeah, and, and the whole idea is to sink the other person's ship, and by doing that, you're slow, like, like David said, you're slowly taking pieces off, which have negative attributes underneath them. Right. So taking off their sails makes things more difficult for them. Taking off pieces of their deck makes actions more difficult for them in the future. Uh, so you're also going to pick two cannons. Now, there are three different types of cannons yeah. in the game, and they all have um, different ranges and abilities to them. Uh, when you pick them, you place them up here and to your cannon docks, and you're going to fill them automatically with shots. And there's chain, uh, chain shots, there's cannon shots, yeah. and they all uh, affect the board differently depending upon the color that it's shooting at. Yeah, and it's kind of cool too because you you do that secretly. So you yeah. pick your cannons, put them upside down, mm -hmm. and then everyone reveals at the same time. And the cannons, like Jeremy said, are a little bit different. Some are more accurate than others. Yeah. Some of them don't require much accuracy, yeah. uh, so they're easier to fire. Uh, it's it's really that first step of strategy when you're trying to approach this game. And this game, almost like a chess match, does uh, involve a little bit of planning. Right. Uh, the next thing that's going to happen is each of the players is going to... Um get three cards. We call them captains, but the game calls them reputation cards. Yeah. They really are captains that yeah. you can be that are thematic and give you a gameplay ability throughout the entire throughout the entire yeah, game. Yeah, and these this is where the game really uh, has a lot of flavor for me. Right mm -hmm. right from the beginning, you get these, then you get another set of cards we'll talk about in a second. But the captains give you variable powers that are extraordinarily different from one another. Yeah. You know, it's another one of those games where you look at the powers, and sometimes you look at it and think, whoa, how could this be balanced with the other captains? And there's, right. I think... There's Maybe nine of them. Nine of them. Yeah, nine So to have ones. nine different, really distinct captains, uh, you'll find your favorites, and you'll find some that you want to avoid, but the cool thing is you get three th of them. Three cards, and you pick from one of them. Right. So uh, it, it adds a lot of flavor right, right from the beginning. Uh, the second thing is you're going to do, uh, not really a draft, but you're going to do three rounds of three more cards that come into you called 
Dirty, dirty tricks. tricks. And the dirty tricks are one-off cards that you can use to affect specific things in the game. Like it may allow you to uh, add damage when you do damage. It may subtract damage when um, damage is being done to you. It may yeah. allow you to uh, maneuver people around or replace people that have died off your board with new crewmates. whole bunch of them. There's 24 different dirty tricks. Yeah. And by the end of all three of these rounds, you'll have three of them to use for the entirety of the yeah, game. Yeah, and it, again, a lot of flavor here and a lot of variable powers. Mm -hmm. These are really the cards that allow you to break the rules. And and do things like the, the cards say, dirty tricks, things that are completely unexpected. And we'll get to some of them as we explain how the, yeah. the turn structure goes. But they can really, uh, it's one of those things you play a card and you do it and your opponent's going to say, let me see that card for a second, just yeah. to make sure you're doing that, because that's pretty nasty. Yeah. <laughs> and so when people, I, I know people have looked at this box, and they look on the back of it, and they say, wait, there's poker cards in this game, yeah. right? There are. There are four suits, just like a regular poker deck, minus the jack, the king, and the king. Right, no and, face and cards. the queen, yes. And they're all one through ten. So now these are used very specifically in the game to aim your cannons at other people. Mm -hmm. How that works is you'll be zeroing in the cannons that you've placed and shooting at other players with these uh, aim cards. Yeah, uh, targeting tar cards. Targeting cards, yeah. correct. And all the targeting cards are different. They have numbers on the left and numbers on the bottom. And what you're trying to do is get numbers that match those areas in order to get perfect shots or good shots. Yeah, basically the aim cards, which are the poker cards, affect your accuracy on that particular target. So, right. I mean, a little a la Battleship in a way in terms of your lining it up coordinates-wise, mm -hmm. but it's really just your targeting and then wherever you happen to be targeting on the ship is yeah. where you're going to hit. Right. So uh, everyone's going to draw, is it four cards? Four cards, unless you have a captain that allows you to draw more. Yeah, so four of these aim cards, possibly more if you have a specific reputation card that lets you do so. Um, and then you're going to do two more things for setup. You have two different unique markers. You have a uh, targeting marker and then a gunner. Yeah, like a going, powder keg. <laughs> yeah, so what you're doing is you're picking which one of your two cannons want to start off the game firing. You put that right next to the cannon, and then you're trying to choose where you want to fire. Now, this the unique mechanism here is that each of the places that you're firing, either the sails, the deck, or the the, the, the planks of the boat, have a number or a targeting number. Mm -hmm. That's how many of these targeting cards that you have to put in front of you right. uh, so to hit it. Yeah, so some of them have ones, like the sails and one of the, uh, the deck uh, spots have a one, right. which... You just put one targeting card, so you're going to be able to more quickly fire that cannon because right. you're looking for two aim cards. Whereas if you go for the bigger, more severe spots, it takes a little bit longer to fill those two targeting cards with four. And that just represents how hard it is, basically, to hit those areas on. Right, on and the exactly. Ship. So, and, and the other thing about this targeting, obviously, when you target a spot on the deck, you're mm -hmm. going after crew. Yeah. Uh, if you're targeting down here, you're going to be hit, taking care out planks, and up here you're taking out sails. And again, these have different penalties when you uh, when you do damage and when you're using specific cannons and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. All of it. It's really intricate how it all weaves together. The cannonballs you have loaded in your cannons make a difference. The mm -hmm. type of cannons you have make a difference. Right. Where you're targeting. I mean, it's really interesting. And while it's not. It's probably not the most fast-paced game in that respect, but mm -hmm. it's really thematic that way. Yeah. Because you imagine if you're on this massive ship, it's this big sort of ship-to-ship -ship combat, so you're having to put in place a lot of effort over a period of time to mm -hmm. hopefully pay off. But the turns go fast. The turns do. Oh, the turns, the turns... The game moves fast, but thematically it feels like that lumbering battle between two ships, which is cool. Right, right. So... Uh, to start off the game, one player is going to take, or every player in turn order, just back and forth, is going to take two actions. Right, exactly. The t so the actions are pretty straightforward, and they have them right here on the board. Yeah. Uh, but the first action is to aim. Now, here's the important thing about aiming, and what we missed in our first uh, game. One of your two actions must be to aim. And we messed that up We messed badly. that up. And yeah. while you think, well, what, what kind of difference does that make? It makes a huge difference because if you're having to burn one of your cards to aim no matter what, yeah. you might be playing a card that doesn't really improve your aim, right. first of all, and you're, you're limiting your hand size. So it really limits the other things that you can do on your turn, which we'll get to in a second. So right. you have to aim as one of your two actions. Yes. And aiming is simply taking one of the cards from your hand and placing it down on your target. one of your current target cards. Yeah. 
and you can replace other target cards. So you don't necessarily have to fire that cannon when it has both of the right. the reticules in line. It's just ready. It's ready to fire. Yeah. It's aimed. For instance, this one right here requires an eight and a two for a perfect shot. I have an eight and a three, which is going to give me a good shot. But what Jeremy might not know is I'm using a cannon that doesn't have a penalty for a good shot. It's yeah. basically just as good of a, as a perfect shot. Right, right. So that's the first action, aiming, is laying one of the aim cards down. The second action is to hold, you mm -hmm. know, so that's just everyone hold. wait, and that's drawing a card. Yep. So that's really one of the main elements during your turn, or really the only way to, to increase your hands, uh, the, the cards in your hand. So you draw a card when you hold. Uh, the, the next option is to reload. Reload is either discarding two of any card mm -hmm. or a pair of cards. Now, the reason why you need to reload is when you actually fire a shot, it expends the shot in that cannon. Right, so you have to get rid of one of these little cannonball discs. Right. So say if I shot this, I'm empty on this cannon, yeah. so I either need to reload or I'm going to need to zero in on another target and right. move my powder keg gunner over to my other cannon. Yep, yep. So the next thing is, uh, like I said, reloading. When you reload, you can discard any two cards or a pair. Yep. When you do any two cards, it's a single reload. Yep. So you're literally just drawing one uh, mm. disc out of that bag yep. and putting it in the, uh, the spot that's open. Right. When you do a full reload, you discard a pair, and you can take any cannonballs that you currently have, put them back in the bag, and then draw the total amount out and redistribute them, redistribute them as you see fit. And that's a great way to... It's huge. Yeah, to figure out where their defenses are and, and what you've destroyed. And if you need to make a change on the fly, you're not uh, stuck with that particular shot, which, as David said earlier, if he's shooting this white uh, chain shot at my sails, that's great because it matches the color. But if he needs to shoot down here, he needs to reload and get a different type of uh, and that's cannon shot in there. probably one of the easiest things to overlook too yeah. when you're in the heat of this battle right oh, okay i'm going to move over to that cannon and finish off his sails but then you realize oh i've got brown cannonball discs there so you automatically take a penalty when you're shooting the wrong color mm -hmm. so th that that's one way to to mitigate that right so the next thing is to repair repair is you just discard any uh any type of cards you want one to three cards yep and that's when you can move these little black cylinders which represent your crew mm -hmm. And if, say, I had some sails damaged, I could discard two cards, remove these two crew from the game, and repair my sails. And the reason why you want to repair or move your crew around from spot to, bo to, from spot, to spot is because, uh, as we said, underneath of each of these sails and crew members are negative things right. that will happen. So uh, when he just removed that crew member, as you see right here, it's a negative one to his firing permanently when he's shooting from that cannon right. on that side of the ship. So I'm, I'm the, the trade-off there is that I'm trying to repair this sail, which is going to allow me to evade a little bit better when I'm fired on, mm -hmm. but at the penalty of I'm not able to fire as well. Yeah. So it's really a delicate balance of like what you're wanting to try to do, uh, what you wanted to do and adjusting. And the cards that you have in your hand <laughs> at that particular time, which may not be the greatest cards. Exactly. Card, so. So the next thing after repair is the broadside, and this is probably one of the cooler yeah, of like the standard this. actions. The broadside, uh, in fact, Jeremy, I think you have a hand of cards that's great for the broadside. Uh, I do, yeah. yeah. So in my hand, I have a, uh, a wild card. This can act as any suit and any number. And then I have three diamonds. Uh, when you do a broadside, you're allowed to get rid of uh, one through four possible cards. Mm -hmm. And what it happens, they have to be all be of the same type of suit or flush. Um, when you do that, you can remove that many same uh, shots from your cannons, and it forces the player to remove those same matching things from their board. So, for instance, you see I have two black or three blacks and a brown, which would force him to remove three crew members and one plank from right. his board. It also has another effect. This is the big one. It <laughs> makes him remove the cards that are on his targeting. So you see he has an eight and a three right here. It would uh, make him remove those right. up to the number of cards that I... Yeah, so if I'd had a, a two targeting cards out there with maybe four cards on there, right. I'd be taking all of that aiming 
off. So all that effort you put in for the last several rounds is poof, yeah. gone. And it can set players back for a while. Timing is really, really key on when you do specific right. actions in this game. Um, so that's broadside. Uh, the other thing you can do is shear off, and I'll show you with the same hand. Shear off means that you can take a straight. Um, and you'll notice on the board, when you take a shear off, you have to mark those, so you can't use those numbers again. So say, for instance, I use the 8, the 9, and the 10. I cover the 8, 9, and 10, and that allows me to remove that many cards plus one from his hand. So if he's sitting on a hand, I think he's going to use that to either aim or to broadside me. I can say, I'm going to shear off that many cards from your hand, and I won't be able to use these numbers again, but now I've set him back even further. Right. It, it, you can really set up really good turns mm -hmm. with shearing off, um, you know, if you have the perfect hand and you're ready to fire, mm -hmm. you can shear off and then fire so and then aim no and then fire. And I'm stuck without any cards. So talk about, uh, firing Dave and I'll talk about the evasion portion of it. Yeah. So after you've taken your two actions, you have the option to fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, and usually you're going to do that when you have all your aim cards, there are some possibilities to do it without, but that's really something you want to do in a pinch. Right, right. Uh, it's, it's almost a guaranteed miss, and it might have an, a side effect. But anyway, when you fire, it's an option. It's not one of your actions. Optional thing you do at the end of the turn. You simply check out your aim cards, mm -hmm. see whether it's a perfect shot, and then you're going to go on this firing meter right here. And you're going to look where you're firing. So I'm firing right now at his sails right here. The total potential damage that can be done is three. Which, so is, which is equal to the number of cubes or wooden pieces in that spot. So if he, if he chooses this portion of my deck, it's six. If he chooses this portion of my uh, the hull of my boat, it's four because there's four wooden pieces. Right, and for example, if I'd already done two damage to that sail, yeah. it would be a total possible damage of one. Yeah. So kind of thematically, as you pick the boat apart, it's kind of harder to shoot the little pieces that are left. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I would start at three... And then, basically, any penalties, so if I wasn't shooting a, the perfect right, shot. a perfect shot or the right cannonball, I would take that down one or two. Mm -hmm. But let's say I start at three, and then once all of the penalties, the natural pen penalties are taken into consideration, Jeremy has the opportunity to evade. Uh, and again, I'll use this hand again. As you can see, a straight and a flush are pretty good in the game. So you can use a, uh, a straight to evade. And it just depends on the number of cards you wish to right. use. Say, for again, uh, for instance, again, I wanted to use these three cards. Your evasion is equal to the number of cards in your straight halved, unless it's a flush. Right, and then straight it's a flush, it's one-to-one. One. So if he were to do three damage, I have three cards in my straight, and they're all a flush, I would just... He would miss all three of his right. shots. And then you mark those as well on this board with three more cubes of the numbers that you used for that flush. So you can't evade with those numbers again. Exactly. For the rest of the game, yeah. I know that he can't use an eight, a nine, or a ten. Even he couldn't use six, seven, eight like because yeah. the eight is done. Yeah. He cannot use that, which is – this is really one of the cool mechanisms of the game. The broadside, the shear off, and the evade are really powerful, and you have to use them. Mm -hmm. But over time, you can't – you can no longer use them. Right. Uh, in one of our games, I had a, a captain, or no, I had a dirty trick that allowed me to place four cubes on any of his, you know, broadside, shear off, or evade, so I could clog up some of his opportunities, especially mm -hmm. for the straights. You can kind of strategically spread them out yeah. and really mess with someone's opportunities right, there. Right, because you can't play a straight or a shear off with just one card. It's got to be more than exactly. one card. Exactly. So. Um, and that's the basic gameplay. The, the game is going to end in one of uh, a couple different ways. One is if at any point you have killed the opponent's um, captain and their first mate. Right. Or if you've collectively destroyed ten planks um, off the, the hull of right. the ship. Uh, and that ends the game. Right. In fact, uh, the game, once you get to that point where you're getting close to winning or losing, mm -hmm. uh so far, anyway, in our games, it's been very clear that the end is was near. near. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, again, in a gameplay standpoint, it might feel a little slow and bogged down in terms of, like, your, your abilities. Not the game flow. The game moves very fast. But you really feel like you're on a sinking ship. It does, yeah. <laughs> and, and the game can be a little bit slow at the beginning, too, because you have all of those dirty tricks in your possession. Right. So people who have spent five, six turns building up the perfect shot to hit your hull 
oh, I, you know, I, I play this and you've missed twice. And yeah. then I'll evade the other two damage. And then they have to restart from the beginning and re and their cannons, re-get their shot ready. So timing, as, as we said again, is really a key factor in, in making sure that um, you're staying one step ahead of yeah, your timing is Yeah, timing is super important. This game is a game of making plans, foiling plans, yeah. and then adjusting to foiled plans. Right. And... You know, it, more so than most other games, you really feel that. Every time you've laid out three of your four aim cards on your targets and then someone broadsides you and you sweep those away, it's frustrating. Yeah. I mean, it really does feel frustrating. But, but thematically, again, it them feels perfect. Thematically, it's awesome. Yeah. The, the shearing off, uh, the fact that broadsides, you know, basically you're bumping up against or blasting against another ship. So, of course, all this, all the time they've spent aiming... Is and it does and nothing. it does that pepper damage all over as right, well, which exactly. makes sense. You're not focusing on one area; you're focusing on whatever you have out here and just taking off little tiny pieces here and there. Maybe uncovering something that's going to hurt them in the future because they're starting yeah, to dwindle yeah, down exactly. with their resources. You can, you can go for precise attacks, mm -hmm. or you can kind of go for erratic. Just I'm going to try to blast them as much as possible because mm -hmm. the precision attacks. I think if someone goes that route, you could go more that route where you're going to take out the captain and the first mate. Mm -hmm. Whereas taking out the ten planks might be the I'm just going to bombard them whenever I can and as often as I can. Yeah. So, uh, what negatives do you have about the game? Well, I don't know that they're negatives, but I'll say that it's it. it like I said, it, the game moves quickly, mm -hmm. but it does feel like y you could do a lot of things only for them to be all taken away. Mm -hmm. And that can be very frustrating uh, for a lot of players. I mean, I'm fine yeah. with it, and especially when you're playing a two-player game. Whenever you sit down to play a two-player game, you've got to know you're in this to win it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're facing each other. This is a ship battle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's going to be uh, things that go wrong, and you have to just roll with it. Um, but with that said, that would be maybe one negative for some people, I think, mm -hmm. that, you know, you could put a lot of effort in only for that to all be swept away. Mm -hmm. um, but again, for me, the other thing that kind of saves that, like you said a second ago, the theme that's wrapped around that. It, yeah. it, it feels very much like a sinking a, ship. A sinking ship. Yeah. When, at the end of the game... It can feel extraordinarily defeating. restrictive and defeating because yeah. your mm -hmm. ship is in bad shape. Yeah. You can't shoot this cannon. <laughs> you can't move this guy. Jeremy's over there just, <laughs> you know, blasting cannonballs. Yeah. So you just really kind of feel like there, this, there's this, no hope. The, yeah, we're yeah. done here. Well, I don't know if we've played it enough either to see if no. there's a way out of that. Um, I'd love to see a, to see whether or not we could turn the tides, so to speak. Yeah. And have a, a bleak situation turn around um, and, and, and go the other way. Yeah. I, know, I, knew, I do know that there's some dirty tricks and some captains that could potentially help yeah, And that. that really depends on your ability to draft well, too. Right. I mean, if, you, if you're picking um, the right cards, and there are some pretty powerful... We had a really good discussion about the captains. Um, I picked a captain that allows you, when you do the hold action, um, we... we rewind for just a moment we forgot to mention at the end of your turn you're always drawing two cards oh that's right so that's right refilling your hand as anyone who plays any kind of um tournament level magic um or any kind of ccg you know that the quicker that you can draw cards the better you offer in the game this captain that i use allows you to draw two cards when you do the hold action instead of one and your ability to cycle through your cards quickly and find the right aim cards that destroyed you i mean that's, oh, did. that's one of the things our last that, game you were filling up two targeting cards very easily right. while I was just struggling with one. I mean, you could have filled up yours, but I was pulling the right ones. When I'm pulling two cards from that and then two cards from the end of the turn, my, my ability to cycle through my deck was Yeah, the other key quick. there, too, is Jeremy used a couple really strategic sheer-off maneuvers, which took all the cards out of my hand, yeah. leaving me with just a couple, which really is so crippling. I don't know if that's a negative of the game i think that's just a strategic choice I, I when you look at the game as a whole though i think it all makes sense there's nothing in it that says hey this isn't going to work this doesn't this is broken except maybe that card right I yeah mean, even would... even the, the dirty trick cards are pretty even throughout i mean yeah. there's nothing that came that said oh that's a game breaker. i didn't see one dirty trick uh -huh. that was like oh that's yeah. really overpowered yeah i would say it's not broken yeah. but i would say when you're playing this 
if you're experienced at the game mm-hmm. and someone isn't, this is not a game that potentially would be fun for the inexperienced player. Yeah. This is one of those games, just like if you two friends played chess a lot. Yeah. If you played this a lot with a friend and you both tried to excel at it, it would be a great game. Mm-hmm. But it's not a great game to say, hey, you want to try this game that I've played several times and you've never played? Uh, because that person's probably going to lose. So we've talked about this for a while, David. You said you might want to give this a rating. What would you rate this game? I would give this, uh, if we're going on like a 10 scale, sure. uh, I would probably still, I would give this a 7.5. Um, this this game is a super solid game. It has a theme that I love. And it like the, the theme, every step of the way, and not just the general theme mm-hmm. of like, oh, it's pirates and I like pirates. Yeah. The theme and how it works with all the mechanics in the game. Yeah. That's to me when a theme really works. Yeah. When you look at shearing off and what it does to mechanically in the game, and we yeah. look at evasion and broadsides and how those behave in the game and how you uh, yeah. power them and, and their effects, that's really flavorful. So it takes away any of this sort of downside of like, oh, I put all that effort in and now it's gone. The theme is really where this uh, shines, as well as how the theme works with the mechanics. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Uh, I. I would probably lean more. Yeah, what about more, you? Uh, yeah, probably more on the 8 side, maybe a 7.5. I, I think it needs more plays to see if um, if there's a way to dig yourself out after a specific point. Because you- I think both games that we had, once you get past a threshold in the game um, where your cannons aren't uh, as powerful anymore because you have a negative 1 or a negative 2 on them, there seems to be no way out of that. Like, you are yeah. just going to slowly die, and it may be five or six turns, maybe ten turns before someone can shoot the rest of your deck and get um, the rest of the planks off there. So it's And there's no way really to fight back at that point because your crew is dead. There's no way to replenish your crew. You're just out, and it's just a slow death from that point. Yeah. So if we played it more, uh, I mean, it may go down less if we find out that that is a crippling portion of the game. Agreed. Um, or it may go up more if we find out, hey, the next game that we play you came back from almost a defeat, and then my score could go up to like an 8.5 because, as you said, the theme is so intricately uh, weaved into the mechanics of the game. And then even the graphic design on it, despite these cards, oh. which are just poker cards, the rest of the graphics, the the captains, the dirty tricks, the art on the board, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Oh, the components are fantastic. Yeah. Even the poker cards, in my opinion, just the fact that they're poker cards is kind of unique and strange, but they have... You know, specific backs that feel thematic to the game. Yeah. And then even the fronts are kind of, like, distressed. Yeah. So it's not just this crisp poker card. It looks yeah. kind of an, like an old-timey yeah. poker card, if you will. So for you guys that haven't went to look at Merchants and Marauders, make sure you're looking at the correct Merchants and Marauders. Right. And it's a really good game. I don't think it got a lot of um, a lot of attention at all at Gen Con. So it didn't, really. if you're a two-player uh, gamer and you like something that's... Less than a, an hour to play. Go and check it out. I think you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised by yeah, it. Particularly if you like competition, for sure. Yeah, it's very much a take that game. So thanks, guys. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to us on Facebook. Um, Comment as much as you can down below yeah. or on any of any of our social media outlets. Yep. We'd really appreciate it. And we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Season 1 of Man vs. Meeple is sponsored by TMG Games, publisher of great games like Yokohama, Guilds of London, and the soon-to-be-released Coliseum.